Hello internet people, welcome. Today we will do another stream about our test and debugging infrastructure that we are building up for this code base. So in the previous stream we um, we got some uh, heap buffer overrun uh, checks working and actually even with a relatively small effort so let's take a look the the whole the whole memory allocator code is currently at about 400 lines and this includes already some convenience functionality not only the, the overrun checking it also includes um, a complete um, mapping of all our heap allocations so we can at any point we want we can uh, print out a map of the complete heap that we have and all of this in in few hundred lines is already more powerful than what we get from the Microsoft um, debug runtime at least in terms of overrun checking so in last stream we saw a particularly subtle case of a buffer overrun that was not detected by the Microsoft uh, debug runtime, but it is detected now uh, by our new infrastructure for heap debugging. And if we combine it with test randomization, so that will be the, the second big topic for today will be test randomization. So we will start to build up a convenient setup to do that. And first we will talk a bit about why you might why you might want to do it and what is important if you do it. Currently I'm still cleaning up a bit of the code. So um, just getting some hard coded constants out of the functions and simplifying them a bit to make everything look a bit nicer and to reduce redundancy in our definitions. What I also um, I think what I also want to do is currently we the, the overrun check works in the following way that we put we put eight bytes extra at the beginning and end of every heap block we allocate and we put a kind of magic guard value there that we calculate um, for each array and so we put it there on allocation and whenever we free or whenever an explicit check is made we, we check that these guard bytes are intact and what I want to um, I want to extend this a bit so that we can specify the number of guard bytes that we want to have uh, let's say in multiples of eight to keep it simpler and because we might have all overruns that actually do not uh, directly write into the last bytes before or after the buffer but that move beyond that <coughs> and um, to find such cases we might want to crank up the length of the guard bytes. <clears throat> so I think that's that's something we can do as a warm-up. So let's define a constant expression n um, the number of guard uh, uint 64s. Let's for now set this to 1 if we have the overrun check and to 0 otherwise. So this will be decided at, at compile time. And our prefix and postfix bytes are then just the number of this times size of u in 64, which is of course, of course 8, which we could we could hard code without losing much, but in this way it's a kind of documentation of what, what we are what we are doing here. So we have the number of prefix bytes and the number of postfix bytes that will now scale with the number of 
number of guard values. So all of the pointer arithmetic that we do will just work fine. Also the guard value, guard value calculation, I think we will keep it the same. The question is, do we, do we want to have different guard values? Maybe we want different, yeah, just to add some extra sensitivity. Maybe we want, want to have different, um, maybe we want to pass in an index so that we have different guard values in the different slots. Uh, let's actually make this sign so we can also distinguish between beginning and, en and end if we want. And we will just mess around here with our So let's make this signed also. So we get a signed number here that will then be extend and will then be converted to unsigned int 64, whatever. Uh, the details are not so important. We just want to create some interesting numbers that do not contain lots of zeros and so on. And we always have our guard value seed to inject some entropy in, into this. And we saw in the last stream, we, we saw how important it is to inject entropy because otherwise you can just by chance not, not notice that something is going wrong. So let's write the block guards. And here we now just, we will um, just build a loop So actually, I probably want to make this sign to yeah. So I have a bit of an easier time maybe using positive and negative indices and so on if I want to do that. So the pointer, the pointers. This is then the user pointer minus minus i plus one times size of u int sixty-four. And we, here we have size plus i times size of u int sixty-four. So let's format this maybe in a bit nicer way. So the, this is parallel to that. Something is wrong because we have not the same number of parentheses. Yeah. And then uh, let's actually calculate the guard value separately here so we can have different guard values at the beginning and the end. Um, so here we will have index minus one minus i let's say and at the end we will have index one plus i. Actually, now we could even remove that because <clears throat> the optimizer should completely remove the whole loop normally if we um, if the n guard u in sixty four is zero. So we can make our code a bit cleaner by removing that. So now for the check. Very, very similar. 
here that the only difference is here we have a loop that uh, checks beginning and end and Uh, let's see what is the nicest way to do that. So let's put the loop on the outside here. For the pointer calculation, we do the same thing as above size plus index times size of u int 64 and the other option for the beginning let's also parallelize it like this i plus one here The good thing is the code is basically self-checking because if we mess up anything, we should immediately notice that the values don't match. So the guard value will be recalculated every time now. So if j is zero, we uh, j is non-zero we are testing the end so in this case we have one plus i otherwise we have minus one minus i for the index and we actually will include this in in the the error message so at beginning and end we have this information at beginning end and here we will <clears throat> here we will report the number of the guard slot where the problem is detected that's just the index i and we will test this soon to make sure that we, we get a correct report. And actually, actually, we can do the same here to remove this. Yeah, this should also then be optimized away it if it's not used. And also in in a non-deeper build, we will probably completely, completely exclude all of this code from even from compilation properly. So that will not be a problem to make sure that we have no, no runtime costs in the release build from any of this. Okay, I think uh, that should be it. And I want to point out one thing: um, how easy it was. To, to increase the size of the guard areas because I had already concentrated all the knowledge about the guard areas in these small inline functions here. So these are the only points in the code that need to know um, how much is the shift or how much is the offset from the beginning of the heap buffer used by the user code and the actually allocated buffer and so on. Only this very small area of code needs to know about that and the rest just uses these self-documenting function calls. Okay. Okay, sequence number we do not yet. So currently, currently we use the same guard values for all areas of the same size in the same slots. We could, we could even um, 
add more variation by adding some kind of sequence number here so that we um, we cycle through different guard values but yeah I don't know if it's really needed in the end we have so much entropy injected by this uh, randomized guard value seed that uh, details like this are probably not so important so let's see if things compile What? Uh, oh yeah, we we need. Ah, uh, this is this is completely gone. This is not needed anymore. So we are passing, and now we will introduce a bug like we did last time we will introduce an artificial buffer overrun first we will do it by wrongly calculating the length of an array that we need to allocate So this is the overrun by one byte that actually only modifies a few bits in, in the byte past the end of the array that we had last time. So let's see if we are still detecting that. And if the error message is, is correct and then we will make more. Yeah, we are still detecting it. Heap memory overrun at end in guard slot zero of block Blah blah blah. PDF pass a long half prefix array expected actual. That looks very nice. So that's exactly what we expect. So we detect the overrun. Sorry. Okay, now let's do some other kinds of overrun. Uh, let's do an overrun that goes. Let's do an overrun that reaches uh, eight bytes beyond the end of the array. So this would be, this would be exactly the first byte that we are not allowed to access. So let's go eight further and let's see if we detect that. We shouldn't currently, I think, because we only, we only use eight byte of card data. So it could be that, ah, we are running into, we are running into the guard data of the Microsoft runtime library that puts also I think four bytes at least of guard data but they always use the same guard data and that's a weakness as we as I will demonstrate shortly so now the Microsoft runtime library detected that which is fine but if we do something like this let's only set let's set the high the highest bit of this byte and let's see whether the Microsoft runtime library catches that kind of over overrun no it doesn't it doesn't catch it because it uses the guard value hexadecimal FD which has the highest bit set and that's what I found out the last time um, we also did not catch it now because we are only checking eight uh, bytes currently. So let's increase that. And then we will also only check it, uh, we will only, only catch it um, stochastically. 
So let's crank this up to two. Because it depends on our randomization, whether we will be lucky enough to have a zero bit there where the one bit is introduced, so we can detect it. So currently we passed. So let's just, yeah, now we fail. So we now have a 50% chance to check this. And the good thing is with things like this, uh, because it will be tested every time the unit tests run, a 50% chance means in the end an overall basically 100% to, to catch such things. So heap memory overrun, guard slot one is, it is now, this is fine. At end of block, blah, blah, blah. Um, very nice. Now let's, Let's try something different. Let's do, uh, let's do the same thing at the beginning of the array. First in the first, in the, the first byte past the beginning. This should be guard slot zero and we should have cat, we should have catched it already before. Our extension so yeah we catch it guard slot zero at the beginning heap over, memory overrun at the beginning of block blah 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 um, yeah now we see it is in the highest the, the most significant bit <coughs> of the guard value that's nice and now let's check minus nine. This should be the first byte that uses guard slot one at the beginning. In the meantime, let's document a bit. Uh, so we didn't catch it, but that could be just chance. Let's run again. No, we are not catching it. So either we are just not lucky. Yeah, it was just bad luck. Now we caught it. Guard slot one at beginning of block. Great. So our warm up exercise is a success. And now let's just um, Let's just document here that this is the number of 64-bit card slots to put at the beginning and end of every heap allocated block. For, for overrun checking. So let's say for checking against overruns. Great. Also our code got a bit nicer because now the if devs are not scattered throughout the whole thing. Um, So having done this small extension, let's take a step back and discuss a few more general things. So one thing is right now I'm at the beginning of building up this code base and I'm investing relatively uh, a lot of my time into building up the infrastructure and I want to say a few words about why I do that. So what I have a, an experience that I have gained or confirmed in every project that I made is that investing early into your project infrastructure pays really large dividends. So if you if you set up your build system correctly, if you if you have <clears throat> a nice test setup in place and all of these things, they really they they really pay off and pay off again and again and again. And these 
these dividends are collected throughout the whole um, uh, time, the, the whole um, lifetime of the project. Therefore, I like to do this early because then the, the return on this investment is, is the greatest. Of course, there is one uh, caveat to consider. So what you do not want is to red hole endlessly into infrastructure topics and not actually get your real coding done. That would be a problem. So you really should be pragmatic about this. And therefore, my approach is always the most important rule is always keep a always keep the project building so never never leave the infrastructure at the end of the day for example never leave the infrastructure in a state where it doesn't build and you cannot continue work on the project itself so always keep things running even if it means uh, not always doing things in the best way not always implementing all the features right the way that you want to have so that's also something uh, put things in place but they don't need to be perfect and they don't need to be complete uh, as the project goes on we will get many more ideas what we can do with this um, this um, heap debugging infrastructure for example but First, we just get some basic things in place and we start to use the infrastructure and the rest can come later. So that's the, the trade-off that you have to make. The next thing I want to talk about and I actually want to do today is test, test randomization in general. The first question is, why would you want to do, why would you want to inject um, randomness into your testing? And there are a couple of reasons you might want to do it. Uh, one, re one very good reason is uh, to reduce the re redundancy of your tests. So there are, there are a couple of sources for redundancy in tests. One is just lack of imagination. So if you write unit tests, for example, depending on your experience and, and how careful you are, you might choose interesting test values or less interesting ones. Maybe if you are a rather inexperienced programmer, you will always use the same numbers and so on. You will not know which, which numbers, for example, are typically um, good for, for triggering bugs and so on. Uh, and also you might just be not, not be lucky enough to hit a number that, that triggers a certain bug. So that's one one um, source for redundancy in your tests is that you always use the same numbers. For example, you always use 42 um, uh, if, if you call some functions and so on, and it might just happen that with 42 some bugs don't happen and you never see them. The second, more, even more important source for redundancy is that once you have your unit tests written, you execute them every time uh, you you start your test harness, but they do the same thing every time. And over the course of a project, you may, might execute your unit tests ten thousands, hundred thousands of times, millions of times maybe, and they always do the same. They always test the same values. So that's a, a huge redundancy. And why not use all these? all this time, all this energy that is uh, put into running the test harness uh, so many times, why not put some variation into that, some entropy, so that you do, are not testing the same thing every time. So that's, that's another good, um, good reason to do some randomization. And we already saw last time how important this is, for example, for catching, for using this simple mechanism for catching uh, buffer overruns to randomize the guard values that you put at the beginning and end of the buffers. It's such a simple thing to do and it will enormously uh, increase your chance to, to really detect the problem. Okay, so we, we discussed the benefits 
what are the costs? So of course your testing gets maybe slightly more um, maybe slightly more complicated, although the test doesn't have to be much. It might get a little slower. This is also something to consider. And the biggest uh, the biggest thing to worry about is what you definitely don't want is your testing to become non-reproducible because that would be a huge loss. So if um, if you randomize your testing in an uncontrolled manner, you might have the problem that you get a test failure and you cannot reproduce it because the next time you run the test, it is using different values and you don't see the problem again. And that would be, that would be a disaster because your test failure would, would become uh, um, valueless in, in principle. So it, it, it just undermines your confidence in the code, but it does not tell you something because you cannot debug it if it's not reproducible. So that's the, the one important point that we need to set up is if you use test randomization, you must do it in a controlled way such that you are sure that you can always reproduce any problem that you see. And it should be rather easy to, to reproduce it so it doesn't annoy you too much. We will set the infrastructure for that up today. Okay, so larger guard area, this actually we did in our warm up. Memory poisoning, this is something we will do after we have set up the randomization because that's also a nice and simple feature that I want to have. What it means is, so poisoning means that whenever in a debug build, whenever we allocate a memory buffer and we do not initialize it to zero, we will actually fill it with random data. And that is different every time. And so we have a high chance if, if any of this data is accidentally used, uh, erroneously lose, used, uh, we will see problems uh, due to this poisoning. I think this is also something that the Microsoft debug runtime does. I noticed they do it with the stack. I think they also do it with the heap, I'm not sure, but they probably also use a constant value um, and we will, we will use proper randomization. So this will come later. The first thing we will do is to start to set up a convenient um, framework for our test randomization and for our memory um, memory um, checking, so memory integrity and leak checking. And we will do that because I use here the Google test unit test framework, which I use for the first time in this project. So I'm not very familiar with this particular framework. I, I used a handful of other frameworks in the past and they are all rather similar. These unit test frameworks, they're not really, I mean, they have a very, they solve a very, um, sharply defined problem and they, they all solve it in more or less the same way. So I don't expect huge surprises there. And what we need to do is we need some code that runs at the beginning and end of each test that sets up some infrastructure at the beginning and does some final checks at the end. And most unit tests Frameworks have a built-in feature for that and so does Google test. It has these fixtures they are called. And so we, we make ourselves our own um, test fixture that sets things up for us and does checks at the end. So let's see if we can make that work. First thing is we will include gtest here. I think it's gtest, gtest, right? Let's check. Yeah, gtest, gtest. And let's see what kind of 
namespace we want to use. I think we will make a new one. Maybe we don't even, it's, it's a more general thing. So maybe we don't want to put it in one of these small namespaces. Um, let's be explicit and let's say, let's call the fixture test randomized with memory. And we will derive it from testing test, I think it's called. I have here the, yeah, the documentation for Google test. So we need to derive it from testing.test. .test. We will not start the body with protected because protected is um, just annoying in my opinion. We will do everything public like it's, like it's my policy uh, in my own code. So luckily I can do what I want because I'm not working for somebody else here. And I make everything public because that's the way we roll. Um, you can do now either, either a constructor and destructor um, that does things, or you can do a setup and a teardown function, member function. And the, the Google test FAQ explains some things to consider when you might use one or the other. So they say, yeah, you should C++ style is <clears throat> more clean to use constructors and destructors, but they have some problems. As um, you might know, constructors and destructors have quite significant problems and they, I find them quite, quite annoying to use. Um, and I avoid them in, in all my code now. Um, <clears throat> so we will use the member functions. There is one that is set up. Uh, let's, we will tell it that it is an, has to be an override. So we, uh, that's something that Google test also, they um, suggest because often people make typos like this one and then they wonder why their set of function is not called. <clears throat> so set up and tear down. That's all we need. No, that's not all we need. What we also need is some data members because we want to have the memory manager. We want to have the memory manager and for convenience, I also want them to have a pointer to the memory manager that has in my code, this conventional name mem. <clears throat> uh, by the way, maybe I shouldn't do this because there is a convention that many people use and that I also have used in the past is to give all data members an underscore at the end because otherwise you have annoying collisions with um, parameter names and so on and, and you don't know what is a, a data member and what isn't. I will not use this convention in this code base and so I maybe should not use something that looks like this convention and confuses things so I will call this mem instance. Uh, we will also We will also have a status structure that is for our error handling, for our error handling system that I use in this code base. And also here we will have an instance and a pointer to it for convenience. <clears throat> All my structures are plain old data, so they are uh, there will be no problem with default constructing constructors and so on. So we shouldn't need to, to make our own um, default constructor here because these structs they don't need any fancy constructing 
Okay, so let's get to work in the CPP file. Let's implement test with test randomized setup. Actually, uh, as I have not used override so far, I'm not sure if probably I should not specify it here. Let's see. Here we will do at least two things. So we will set up the status structure. Uh, actually with something that we have here. So init for test it is called. Init for test as the instance. Actually, let me set up the convenient pointers right away. Mem is mem instance. So we, will, we can use the short names and pointers, which are also magical names in our code base because they are used and expected by some macros, which is not very clean, but uh, in this code base, I prefer or prioritize um, productivity and convenience and fun over cleanliness. So we have the status initialized. We will also init the memory manager. And then let's implement the teardown. What I also will do, I will just add a debug print so that we see if things are working. Uh, should we print a standard error, a standard out? I don't know, let's first print. So set up so that we just we see that something is going on. And in the teardown, what do we want to do in the teardown? So one thing we definitely want to do is we want to test whether all the heap memory has been released. So we want to check against check against um, memory leaks. Now the interesting thing is I don't know if I can use the Google Google test uh, assertion and expectation expectation macros here. Let's just try it out. So I just recently today I learned that in this is this is one annoying thing that these unit uh, test frameworks make differently. Some some want you to put the expected value first and then the actual, and some want to put you uh, want you to put first the actual and then the expected. It's it's annoying. I mean, for equal, it doesn't matter too much, but yeah, it's it's a bit annoying that you can easily mix it up. And what we want to check is in memory, we have the number of, how is it called, the number, and the number of bytes of payload allocated. This should be zero at the end, otherwise Otherwise, we have a leak. I, and let's see if this macro works here. So if we have a leak, we will also print print uh, what is left on the heap. So we print the block info table. Let's call this leaked. In Google test, I never, I never know, I know whether I should use standard out or standard error. 
I think I will use standard out because it works nice more nicely with Visual Studio because <laughs> Visual Studio stupidly the it seems the test explorer only shows you the last line that you printed to standard error and not the others. And I did not yet find out how you can get the complete standard error in the test explorer, so that's very stupid. But yeah, whatever. Okay, so much for the memory. Now for randomization. Let's first just, um, let's first do the random init with true randomization. So we, we use the, <coughs> basically the local, not the local time, but the, the uptime of the system to randomize things. And I actually would would like to do more than that. I think I actually The problem is the following this uses a tick count that changes uh, that changes once every once every mic a millisecond. I think we will just improve our random init because currently you see it, it uses the tick count that changes once every millisecond. Uh, let's add to that. So let's also use the RDTSC that should change every cycle of the CPU uh, so we get some more entropy there. Because I'm thinking about tests that are executed in a tight loop and in one millisecond you can do lots of tests uh, if your code is reasonable and I do not want all of them to use the same seed if, if we run if, if if this setup is done again and again, which is the way a Google test works, I think that it always calls the setup. If you have many tests, each of them gets its setup core. And so we, we definitely want to have different seeds every time. Which will be a bit of a a bit of a challenge for our logging. So this is something we will need to consider. Because maybe we actually we actually only want to to do the seeding once for each ex test executable because we do not want to log a huge number of, of seeds that would make our our job very difficult. So but we can do it later. So the intrinsic with the RDTC, we already have that. Okay. So let's convert the first test to use this fixture actually. So the test we were looking at is this parse, this test for the parsing of the Huffman table. And we will convert this to use a fiction now. And this is something that is in the in the FAQ of the of Google test that if you want to use different test suite names with fixtures, one thing you can do it is that you just type tab your fixture. like this and then you have a, a new name uh, that you can use for this test. Uh, we will also, so we should no longer need this and this 
and this and this and this. Okay, this this we should put actually in the test tube too. Okay, now one thing that we will change here, but that will actually be an advantage in the future is currently ST and MEM are instances here and we will change that to pointers. So we just need to do uh, some stupid work now. So we want to replace the reference line for this. We want to replace st with st. We want to replace st dot with st arrow. And we want to replace mem dot with mem arrow. There was no mem dot, okay. So, here we in the end, okay, here we have already a macro expect clean memory. Where did I define this in memory.h or not? Expect clean memory. Yeah, maybe I should just use this and change this to standard out. I'm not sure now if I should, uh, let's, let's keep this code for now and let's, let's try to use this macro. And let's run things. How many mistakes have we made? A lot, as always. Uh, status, ah, it thinks this is test status. That's stupid. That is stupid because it's actually namespace status. Did we not include that here? Yeah, we didn't. Oh, but it should be included by the PDF parser, shouldn't it? Test status. Aha, uh -huh, maybe this, this is just closer scope wise. This might just be closer scope-wise, so we maybe have to put a leading column column. Which is a bit annoying. I don't like this at all. It's maybe my own fault for using such resonant names for the namespaces. Uh, test randomized with memory. Ah, this is this is of course in our test util namespace. Okay, we have a warning here. We only want to have the lower the lower 32 bits here. A memory init. Ah, this also takes the status. 
And then actually in this case, since this is in a test, we should assert that it didn't fail. We will try what if these assertions actually work inside a fixture setup. I'm not sure about that. Okay, we have a problem with the framework because we mix tests that use the fixture with others that don't use the fixture. So let's fix that. So it seems we have we have other test parse Huffman table tests. Yeah, we have others. Um, this is one further up. And this does not use memory. So let's just change the name for that. There should be so. There's no point in using the fixture for, for this test that does not do anything with memory. Nice, we have a setup call happening and then we get a detection of our, intro, of our intentionally introduced bug. That's nice. Uh, we don't get it in a teardown because I think because we still have here the explicit, we still have the explicit expect clean memory check here. So let's get rid of that. That should be done by the fixture now. Okay, still not seeing the teardown. We do get the heap now over at the beginning. Let's flush things. So it could be, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm not in Vim here. Um, could be that we are just not seeing this printout because it's not flushed and then we die. Okay, now we see both, um, but now this time we did not detect. So we know that we indirectly, we know that something is randomized. because sometimes we don't catch the problem. Actually quite often we don't catch the problem and now we caught it. Uh, still, hmm. Let's see, let's see where, where this check is called. Check at, ah, okay. This is already detected in the freeing. You see that the check that detects this thing is actually done in PDF parser.cpp and at line 4595. Four, four, five. So if we check that, you will see that this is the free core. 4595 go to, yeah. So this is the core that actually detects that this has been overrun. Which is fine. I mean, we want to detect these things as early as possible. But what we now actually, um, what we now actually want to do is we want to um, detect a, a, a leak at the end of the teardown. So xxx debug leak for testing. 
So let's leak this, this array. What do we get? We get the teardown and then we get a nice failure, n bytes allocated is 291 but we expected zero, number of heap memory blocks one um, has been reallocated, yeah, six times. Some, one block had, has been reallocated six times which is normally would not be a good sign but currently I start all my growing arrays at very large uh, at very small sizes in order to exercise in order to stress test the reallocation so we should keep an eye on that value and later it will go down leaked what have we leaked the long we have leaked the long Huffman prefix array which is exactly what we expect and it is detected very nice so now we have for every for every unit test that we set up in this simple way by just using this fixture randomized with memory we have both test randomization and also memory leak checking and memory um, consistency checking and everything next thing is as we are now doing randomization so let's make this a bit more explicit so we can actually remove all this stuff now let's make it a bit more explicit that we see that we are doing randomization Every time we run this test, we should get, get a different value here. At least with extremely high probability, we should get a different value. A random integer, 18, 7. Yeah, we got a completely different integer now. But the very 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 important thing is that we will need to log we will need to log the seed we used because um, in case of an error we needed to reproduce everything So we are actually putting our entropy only in 64 bits here, which is fine, that's enough for us. And we definitely need to lock these 64, these 64 bits. So <laughs> I'm just wondering if I should do it right here in this function. Let's start by doing it here. Let's make ourselves a test log test log um, <clears throat> log random seed and to have this
to have this more already more usable Uh, let's see, how do we want to do this? I actually want to treat the first two I want to treat the first two as a U in 64, but we don't really know about the, the alignment. So So let's do it like this. I think a 64 bit seed will be enough for this whole project. So we will not use the, the other parts of the seed that we have for the Nozen Twister here. Uh, this will not be the final version of this log function because I think we will also want to to log the name of the test and so on so um, but let's namespace log <clears throat> and the basic idea is just that um, <clears throat> one thing is we will print it print it to standard out for now because why not That's one place where we can get it. But of course we will not rely on the scroll back and so on. Um, I mean, this will probably also be logged by the framework somewhere. But, uh, what we also want to do is we will open a log file. Um, let's see, do we have this, is there a append? I never remember these things. We 
a append, yeah. I think the A plus, the A plus is what we want. Okay, and I think we, we only want the A. We do not want any reposition, repositioning to happen. So A is the thing we want. Um, if we get, so we will, as this is test code, we'll simply assert that we don't get an error. <clears throat> so and then we will print. Uh, and now I also, I definitely want to print the time. Let's see, we have UTC here. Get local time. I think I want a local time for that. Yeah, that looks very usable. System time. So this get local time, can this fail in some way? No, it cannot fail, it seems. That's nice. Always has the time. So, and we will print the years, years, month, day, hour, minute, second. And why not print the milliseconds for fun? So year, month, day, year, month, day. So this is starting at one, that's fine. Uh, yeah, that's this is all straightforward. Yeah, very straightforward. By the way, if you're wondering, currently I'm just coding everything using the Win32 API and I will later go cross-platform and um, modify this. That this will not be a big deal. So we do the fprint. The F print can, of course, also fail. I, th I think this always return an int. 
int here, return value, a negative number is returned. So in productive code, we would have to do some proper error handling, but as this is test code, we just want to notice that something is wrong and nothing else. And then we close the file immediately. So everything should be flushed. That is important. This probably also has the negative on error. End of file returned. Is this negative? Yeah, into a negative integral constant expression. <coughs> Okay, let's try if this does something useful. Of course, it fails with syntax errors first. So did we, yeah, we, we got a random seed report here. Currently we will get this in every test, but we will modify this so we only get it once per test executable. And let's see, do we have a new file here in the where do the test run? Do they run in the build directory? Yeah. So, the time seems right. Yeah, fast random seed. And this should be the same that we saw on the, on the console. Okay, I already closed it, I think. So let's run it again. And we get here. Wow, <laughs> there's something wrong. We got the same value. There is something wrong. And that is why you always must check these things. Probably this is related to the warning we got. Yeah, of course, it's related to the warning we got because I was so stupid not to actually put the seed here. That's also why we got the warning. Very important to check everything. F open is unsafe. <laughs> Consider to use F open under S. I don't think I will. So F open S, I guess, is not a standard function, or is it? It's probably a Microsoft extension. And I will not use it, I think. Okay, so the compiler tells me to use it. But I don't get documentation from Microsoft about it. That's nice. That's nice. <laughs> so I should just use it in blind faith. We will just suppress this nasty warning.
I like my F open. So, are we in better shape now? Yes, we are in better shape. We actually locked the seat correctly. So, the next problem is just that we will do this now every time. We will do the random init every time. And I think I will do this in a very, very, very simple way. We will make ourselves a global I don't know yet where really where to put it, if this should be something that lives here. But let's make an anon anonymous namespace and put the global here. So, something that you should not do nowadays, use global variables, but we will, because it is so easy in this case, and it's good enough, I think. And actually, the whole random state is also a global, so it's fine, because we don't lose any beauty because the random number generator anyway has a global global state. This we use we use this um, yeah here it has a global state vector. We just, uh, I just copied the reference implementation of the Mercent Vista. If we ever go multi-threaded in our testing, we might have to change things here, but we will do, we will cross that bridge when we reach it. So the final thing I need to do is, if we now have a fail, <clears throat> like here, we had a fail. Okay, it, it reports the guard value seed, which is nice. So we could set, manually we could set the guard value seed to be sure. But I actually also want to be able to force a certain seed and I think I want to do this in possibly in different ways so so one very simple way one very simple way I would do it is let's put some forcing here that we can do in the code I uh, just don't know where to put it, probably in the random namespace. And let's <clears throat> let's put something here.
so we cannot force zero, but the chance of getting a failure exactly with zero is so small uh, that if if it ever happens, I just put it manually in the code. Um, so here we'll do a forcing. So if forced seed is non-zero, we overwrite the variable seed and we will print a huge banner and we will print it to i think to both standard out and standard error to be sure that we that we don't miss it because this is something we definitely do not want to miss um, let's also flush everything we are paranoid here about this. Actually, we can move this inside. Oh, actually, we probably want to. I actually I print it anyway, so we just it, it's it's good enough if we. So make this really noticeable. So let's try it first without the force seed. Random seed. And now let's say we we had a fail, then we want to reuse exactly this seed. So I would go here and I would put this seed here and run the test again. Yeah, we get the warning about the forced seed and we should get exactly the same random integer. No, I did not check now because, uh, but let's, let's check it. No, we want a random integer here. Why, why, why is it not? Did it crash now? Did I close it? I think I closed it, but I think I closed it because the command line is so unusable. So this was the one we got here. Let's close everything. Let's run it again. We also see here in the log that we that we get the same seed. <clears throat> so let's remove the forcing. We see here that we use several times the same seed, which otherwise should normally not happen. So we get something completely different now. No warning. Uh, 
and let's force the seed again. What I also should check is that we always get the same guard value seed. So again, yeah. And did we get the same random integer? Yes. We got the same random integer, we got the warning. Let's see, what is our guard value seed? D8, D7. D should always be the same now. D8, D7, yes, always the same. And we always hit the problem now with this seed. Okay, people. Things are basically fine. We cannot miss anything by accidentally closing a window because we have the log of our, all our seeds here. What we still should make sure is that um, if we... Actually, I should turn on some, some light here probably. Um, that if we crash, we actually still get we still get the seed here, that's also important. So now we see the leak. We did not, this time we did not catch the, the overrun, we caught the leak. So we have two bugs that we have intentionally introduced currently, the overrun and the leak. Okay, so this is working, fine. So let's check, let's produce a crash. Let's crash people, let's crash the party. First let's re-instantiate this thing here. Um, let us not do this for now <clears throat> and let's crash like hell. We should get a line, line 16 even though we crash. <clears throat> okay, actually, Google test actually has a structured exception handler. So we still get to tear down, I mean, which is also fine. The only important thing is that we get line 16 here and that we have this this seed this we always must have this so let's fix everything back again so we have some working code Okay, the setup and teardown and the random integer we can remove. That was just for trying things out. Uh, we can remove that because that actually works perfectly. Random integer, we do not need anymore. <clears throat> and what I will do off stream is I will convert all my unit tests now that have memory to use this new fixture. That's just a small amount of busy work.
it's fine. So let's reboot everything and wait forever because these C++ compilers are so incredibly slow. <clears throat> Amazing what the <laughs> how many files you can generate just doing some simple programming with a few small executables. Let's run all the tests. People, are you still here? Are you still here with me? Because this session is coming to an end. There should still be two viewers present. That is great. That is currently my average. I hope you aren't bots. I would not like it if you are only bots. I also hope you liked the, the font size today. Actually, did I? Yeah, because as I as I checked the, the video recording, I noticed that the 12 point font is with the resolution the 720p I'm currently streaming is is readable, but it's maybe a bit borderline readable, especially if you do not full screen your window. <clears throat> so I decided to notch it up a bit for streaming. I actually don't mind the larger font size. I'm not... So programmers come in different kinds, I feel, when it comes to the preferences for for screen sizes and font sizes and so on. And there are a lot of the, those who just want to have as much text on the screen at the same time. So huge screens, tiny fonts. And sometimes I'm like that too, but for me it is rarely the case. I actually, I don't mind seeing only a small piece of my code because for navigation I'm, I mostly use the search functions. Um, I usually don't navigate too much by scrolling. At least I, I think I don't do it a lot. And so I don't mind being concentrated on a small area of code. So even if I'm not streaming, sometimes I use rather large font sizes or small windows. Actually, I have a, I think it's 14 inch notebook that I'm working on here, which many people can't even imagine, I think. But it's not a problem for me. It's just a, a preference. <clears throat> I also like to, to vary the, these things. So I somehow feel it helps me to, to, let's say, to keep enjoying looking at the screen. If I change, for example, the color scheme from, from time to time, I change the font sometimes. Um, I change the font size. I just like a bit of variation there. So currently I'm <clears throat> I'm on this Subtle blue color scheme, blue and white. 
I will soon change to something that's probably I like to to have the variation. Wow! Did we really get did we really get a seed zero? Honestly? <laughs> and I was, I was just talking how very improbable this is. That's amazing. I don't trust this completely. Okay, we are all green people. We are green. Everything is passing and that is so nice. And we have some infrastructure built up. So let's check if actually we did what we came to do. So the, uh, done, this is done. We discussed the why mostly and the how this Okay, this is, this is something we do not yet have. What I would like to have is if a test fails, that there is a marker put into this file so it's easier to find the seed that failed. Otherwise, you might have to try one or two seeds and see which one it was. So that's something. Actually, what I also want to have, want to have here is the test name. I still need to check how to get this from Google test, if, if it's possible at all. I mean, we probably definitely can pass in the test name of the test fixture, but that's not good enough because we will reuse the fixture a lot. So we want to have more information here, so to have an easier time finding the right seed if something goes south. Um, that's still to do. Memory poisoning, okay, this we will do next time or another time, that's not a big deal. Um, yeah. I think it was another successful session. So if you have any questions or suggestions, uh, please put them in the chat now. Otherwise we will conclude this session.